Frankie, let's go. Come on. Thanksgiving 2021, and what a year it has been. Instead of dealing with the hustle and bustle that all too commonly defines this busy holiday season, we elect to ditch it all and get outside. Frankie, Krista, and myself load up the car and head south to Arkansas, to the Buffalo National River. After a quick stop for fuel, ice, firewood, and a few convenience store snacks, it's on the Highway 65, leaving Springfield, Missouri, and commencing the two-hour drive down the Ponca, Arkansas. Rolling over and through the soft hills of the Springfield Plateau, we pass through Branson, Hollister, and then we hit that state line. We cross over one of the tallest bridges in the state, the twin bridges over Cricket Creek. After a few turns and maneuvering around Harrison instead of through it, the landscape begins to change as we approach Ponca, Arkansas. We soon cross the Buffalo at the Ponca Bridge, climb the hill heading east, and then turn off down to the Steel Creek, Creek Campground. It's here at Steel Creek we'll call home for the night. Steel Creek is a popular place in the summertime, and rightfully so. With Roark Bluff stretching three quarters of a mile long and up to 220 feet tall, it's a backdrop that the man's one's reverence. During winter though, the crowds fade as the leaves fall and soon what was once a busy campground becomes a sanctuary of solitude. And plus, the camping is free in the off season. Once here, we quickly pick a site, set up camp, and then head back out for a sunset hike. Now the Buffalo River as a park has strict rules concerning dogs on trails. For the most part, they ain't allowed, but being the good stewards that we're trying to be, we respect those rules. So we head out of the park into nearby forest service land where dogs are welcomed. So we head towards the Boxley Valley, cross the Buffalo River at the Ponca Bridge once again, and then head south on 43. The Boxley Valley is a popular place in the off-season. It stretches for seven miles and with the reintroduction of elk in the 1980s, this is a great place to view them during the winter months. There's also a lot of history in those buildings scattered throughout the valley. After we pass through the valley, we turn on the Cave Mountain Road and begin the steep drive up to where our evening hike begins. By now, if you're familiar with the area, you can probably guess where we're headed to. This ain't no secret of a hike. In fact, it may be one of the most popular, at least the most photographed hike in all of the state. We roll up on the trailhead and to no surprise we're not the only folks there. We throw some gear, water, and snacks into our backpacks and begin the hike to Hawksbill Crag, also known as Whitaker Peak. Trail is around 3 miles with a total elevation gain of around 400 feet. The way there is mostly downhill with the return being back up. Now I must warn you, this trail has suffered from use and abuse over the years. Due to its ease of access and selfie potential, it sees a lot of traffic. I was disheartened to see that nearly every beech tree with a diameter large enough to carve into was graffitied. Every single one. Have people no shame. But we continue on. We descend a little farther and soon cross the drainage that feeds into Whitaker Creek. It's here the high bluffs that the warning signs warned of begin. We take a glance over Haley Falls and then follow the trail along the bluff line. Here, if you can take your eyes off the expansive views for a second, you'll notice a change in the forest. As we approach the crag, we hit a population of shortleaf pine, as our only native pine tree in the Ozarks. It used to be commonplace on the south and westernly facing slopes, but because of heavy logging and clear cuts in the early 20th century, most of it's gone. Be sure to take a moment and breathe in that crisp, fragrant pine tree scent and appreciate it.
Finally, after about a mile and a half, we began to approach the crag. Though we saw a number of people on the trail, by the time we reached the climax of the hike, they were all long gone. We got lucky. We were the last ones on the trail, and so we had it all to ourselves. take our time watching the sun descend over the hills. We enjoy a little snack and just soak it all in. It's a special moment having this view to ourselves. With the way things are going, who knows if this moment could ever happen again. As the sun sets and the sky darkens, we get back to it and head back to the car. We make it back to Steel Creek after dark and got right into cooking dinner. Thanksgiving dinner, that be. What's on the menu tonight? Well, smoked ham and mashed potatoes. The temperature was already dropping, so a warm, delicious meal was just what we needed. We then huddled around the fire and sipped on some homemade spiked apple cider, enjoying the night before turning into bed in our tents. Day two. It was a cold morning. With temperatures that huddled below freezing all night, we awoke to a frost-covered landscape. A beautiful frost covered landscape. We soon got some water heated up for coffee. A hot dose of caffeine is mandatory to get the body moving on a cold winter's day. We hung around camp for a while, easing into the day and enjoying the beautiful morning. Walked from the campground down to the canoe access, with coffee cups in hand, just soaking it all up. Frankie needed a little stretch and movement to get her going. So we went down to the river and just enjoyed the morning. We then headed back to camp to make one more cup of coffee, pack up and begin a day of hiking. With all the gear in the car, we headed out of the campground into our next destination, Glory Hole Falls. The Glory Hole is another dog-friendly hike located on Forest Service land. We park the rig, get our packs, and begin the two-mile round-trip trek to the Glory Hole. Much like Hawksbill Crag, the Glory Hole is a well-trafficked and easy-to-follow trail. With around 400 feet of elevation gain, most of that is achieved on the way back out. Late autumn and into winter is my favorite time for hiking. With the leaves off the trees, the surrounding hills seem to grow in height and stature. There's also no ticks or biting insects out to get you. As you probably noticed, we do allow our dog off leash while hiking. This is done carefully through years of training and still when we see anyone approaching, we take her by the leash out of courtesy. While many folks love dogs, I would hate to negatively affect anyone else's hike. And if we're ever in doubt, we got her leash in our hands. But we continue down into the drainage where the white oaks start turning into the beach and the sound of water is finally heard. 
Glory Hole is a 31 foot waterfall and what really separates it from the others is that instead of pouring water over the ledge of a cliff, the creek has drilled a hole right into the roof of the overhanging bluff, which the water pours right through. It's quite the sight to see. Just be sure to catch it after a good rain. This one is a bit more temperamental than most. After a short hang at Glory Hole, we scurried back to the car to head to our last destination of the trip. Heading east on Highway 16, we passed through the communities of Nail and Deer, and then turned north on County Road 28. It wasn't long and we were at the trailhead of the Alum Cove Natural Bridge. Here is a unique 1.1 mile loop to one of the largest natural bridges in the area. The natural bridge is actually a 130 foot by 20 foot quartz sandstone arch and it's all that's left of a cave that existed well before our time. Considering how short of a hike this is, there's just so much beauty that can be easily had here. I can't recommend this one enough. And yes, people are jerks here too. As you make the loop, you'll first visit the natural bridge, and then you'll cross a small stream to the downhill, and then climb up a bit to visit the bluff line opposite of the natural bridge. Here are a number of shelter bluffs and coves that are easy to explore and climb around in. Supposedly, at one point in time, a herd of free Roman goats occupied these shelters. It's always a treat to explore these ancient shelters and wonder about the folks who visited here a millennia or two or three ago. After walking along the bluff line for a bit, we dropped back down, crossed the creek, and headed back over to the natural bridge, and then back to the car. Here were three dog friendly hikes near the upper Buffalo River area. Whether you have a dog or not, I hope you get out there and explore your public lands. And remember, always leave no trace. Our future generations are counting on us.